Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here uh, and, and hanging out with us. And thank you in advance for all the amazing stuff I read up on, see that you guys have been up to. Uh, for, for our viewers at home and our audience, let, let's begin right at the top. Tell us a little bit about uh, you know, the Brady Center and the Brady Campaign and, and when you guys were founded, things like that. Just... Sure. The Brady Center and Campaign was founded about 40 years ago. We're the nation's oldest, lar largest gun violence prevention mm -hmm. organization. We were founded by Jim and Sarah Brady. Uh, for those of you in the audience, you might know. Or I'm dating myself, I know. <laughs> Jim Brady was President Ronald Reagan's press secretary. He was shot in the assassination attempt against Ronald Reagan. And then he and his wife devoted the rest of their lives to try and do something about gun violence and actually got the Brady Bill passed into law in 1993, and it's been in effect since 1994. And how long have you uh, been working with the Brady Organization, been co-president? Um, I've been co-president fairly recently, yeah. just since September. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and prior to that, I was our chief strategy officer. Um, I'm a lawyer by training, and ages ago, dating myself again, I worked on Capitol Hill for a member of Congress, and one of the issues that I worked on in the 90s was gun violence prevention, and I was there in Congress when the Brady Law actually got passed and was signed into law. Uh, so tell me a little bit about, um, I was looking on the, the website and reading about the three sort of uh, priorities, the three goals. What's, what's the overarching, the major goal that I, that I find to be very ambitious and inspiring for the Brady campaign? Uh, well, our, our goal is to actually cut gun deaths in half yeah. by 2025. And we have three focused campaigns that we are working on to do that. The first is the most obvious one. Uh, the Brady Bill went into effect in 1994, and that has now stopped three million individuals who are felons and people with a criminal history from buying guns. Since that law was passed, though, one in five guns sold today is sold without a background check on the internet or at gun shows where private sellers are not required by law to conduct background checks. So one of our campaigns is to get Congress finally to do what 94% of Americans want to have happen, yeah. which is to expand the Brady Law to cover all gun sales. And let's start with, with that first. I want to talk about that for a second. And then again, for context, for those that, that may not be aware, the Brady Law, of course, was the, the, the it mandated background yes. checks. Right? Yes, yes. And, uh, and now, here we are, years later, trying to get it to, to cover all gun sales whatsoever. That's right. Yeah. Very curious, what is stopping us from being able to do that? Because as you said, as the 90 plus percent of Americans think we should, as, as these events keep piling up and happening over and over again, why haven't we been able to do that? Um, we, we have our answer in the politics in America today, unfortunately. Uh, the NRA collectively contributed around $50 million to get President Trump elected on an, a pro-NRA agenda and many members of Congress. Yeah. So although the polls clearly show that 94% of Americans, you can't find an issue in American politics where there's more consensus on what needs to happen, <clears throat> Congress isn't acting. So what we've done over time is actually get the states to do it. Now we have 20 states that have passed expansions of the Brady background check law or system, but they haven't done it through their legislatures. They've done it in ballot initiatives. Hmm. When you actually put it to the people and they get to vote on the issue, they vote in favor. And they vote in favor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that sort of answers in a way my, my follow-up, which is, and you'll find me asking this quite a bit, is how, how, do, how do we make it happen? How do we as individuals, uh, because I think there's two things that, that we all experience quite frequently now, which is the, the feeling of, oh, no, not again, and I've got to do something at this point, right? Yeah. Um, so let's start specifically with this one. So they're putting on ballots. We can vote. But uh, is it a matter of uh, calling? Is it a matter of showing up? I remember uh, John Oliver did a fantastic piece about the NRA, and he mm -hmm. said the, their strength is that they show up. That's right. That's all it is. Yeah. John Oliver, like in so many things, is absolutely correct. <laughs> Um, and one of the things that I think we have to do as Americans is make this issue a priority. Yeah. Um, you know, I was in Vegas after the mass shooting where in 10 minutes for people going to a concert, uh, we lost more lives than in the second battle of Fallujah, the deadliest battle that we've experienced in modern warfare in 50 years. 
And these are just people going about their lives, going to a concert, like the kids in Newtown going to a school, like individuals in Aurora going to the movies. And we have to say, enough. This is not acceptable. And it's a top issue for us. And when we go to the ballot box to vote come November 2018, each of us here today will have an opportunity to vote for a representative. I encourage everyone to look at the record and see who stands for reasonable gun reform. This has nothing to do with people taking people's guns away. Right. We were founded by Republicans who were gun owners. It's just about common sense safety that's going to protect us all. So make sure to look at the record, and if someone is pro-gun violence prevention and is not endorsed by the NRA, I would encourage you to vote for them and make a change. Is that, honestly, at the end of the day, is, is that what it boils down to, is that the NRA is, is buying their candidates and buying their way through to just keep sort of having free reign to maintain these loopholes and all these different things? That's part That's of it. Part of it. That's, That's part of it. That's part of it. And what they're doing also is, uh, in states across the country, they're making it much easier to basically carry a gun anywhere you want without any restrictions. Right now, they're pushing a bill in Congress that would effectively allow anyone to carry a gun down Fifth Avenue if they wanted to, even though the laws of the state of New York are very restrictive and do not allow just anyone to carry a gun in public. Mm -hmm. The NRA is pushing today a bill that would allow that to happen. So it's a very radical agenda. I think anyone who's a gun owner really has to look at what this organization is doing and question their continued support of the organization. And then state by state, they're trying to push back and they litigate cases, we, we defend cities on this, to actually repeal the reasonable and common sense rules that the states are trying to put in place to protect you know, public places and ensure that we're not you know, facing people toting guns in these places. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's really interesting. I was talking to, so my uncle uh, was actually, he's a, he's a member of the NRA, but he uh, has recently been like, I, I don't know, I don't know what's going on anymore, honestly, myself. He goes, I'm not so sure if I'm going to be, uh, you know, a member much longer. And, and I think it's so easy for us as I've, the most I ever shot was a BB gun when I was a kid. So I'm not a, right. I'm not a gun person. I don't understand it. But I try to understand the different perspectives and try to understand why uh, we're in the position we're in and we're having a fight over this, right? Uh, but, but ultimately, it's a, it's a matter of remembering that the NRA is a collection of many, many individuals. And it's about having these conversations. That's why I'm very excited that you're here. I want to... Um, I want to move, because that's part one. Is that's, the, part right, one. that's where we, so it's very easy to go down so many tangents here, but part right. one is uh, expanding the, the background checks beyond just uh, where they are now, covering all gun purchases. Correct. Uh, part two, I was really intrigued by, is these bad apple uh, gun, dealers. gun dealers. Tell us yeah. a little bit about those and, and what's going on there. Sure. This um, stat blew my mind when I read it, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it blows everyone's mind. <laughs> blows my mind still, and I talk about it every doing day. It for <laughs> Um, in America today, 5% of gun dealers are responsible for the sale of 90% of crime guns. So the guns that are recovered on the streets that are associated with crime actually come from about 5% of the gun dealers. So our Bad Apple gun dealer campaign has in its sights actually shutting down or reforming those bad apple gun dealers who are supplying the criminal market of guns in this country. And they're doing it in part because we hear a lot about the importance of enforcement. Let's just enforce the laws on the books, shall we? Well, the, the answer to that is we completely agree. It's just that ATF, the agency that's charged with enforcing the rules against gun dealers or you know, for the benefit of the good gun dealers, the 95% out there who are doing all of the right things, has almost no money to do it, is not heavily invested. The average gun dealer, just take a guess how often the average gun dealer is inspected by our ATF. Is it uh, similar to how often the delis get inspected and they get their little <laughs> A or B ratings? Because if <laughs> I wish. So that's a good analogy. Yeah. They're routinely inspected. The ATF inspects the average gun dealer every six to seven years. I was hoping you were going to say weeks or months. Well, so years. Right. So our campaign is about increasing enforcement. Yeah. It's actually about educating the community 
about where the bad apples are in their community so we can take action. And that takes a lot of work because the ATF is precluded from Congress, precluded by Congress from publishing the names of these bad apples. I was going to say, what is that the biggest challenge is identifying them? How, how do we identify them? And then once they're identified, why, why haven't we been able to just say? It, takes, is, it yeah. takes some work. Next. And, and uh, but the people who are most supportive of our efforts, I mean, among many in the government of these activities are actually law enforcement, they're police. So we're working cooperatively in many of our bad apple cities with police departments to actually help us identify these bad apples and then use all of the resources at our disposal at Brady. We have an organizing team, we have a long history of bringing legal cases against bad apples. And we have the groundswell of political support that we can push behind it. Well, uh, and that brings us to our third step, which is a lot of what we're doing right now, which is uh, changing the, the conversation and changing uh, the culture. You know, have you guys noticed in the years that you've been doing it with shows like uh, Samantha B and John Oliver and all these sort of educational edutainment kind of shows, have you noticed an uptick in engagement in people uh, looking for answers, looking to help and stuff like that? We have noticed an uptick, I would say, really in the last six to nine months, what I've noticed is something similar to your story about your uncle, yeah. who's a lifelong NRA member. People contacting us, you know, veterans, law enforcement folks, a friend of mine who I've recently made, na made named Joe Plensler, who served overseas in two combat missions, carried a gun, has guns at home, is involved in all sorts of gun shows. He called me up and said, I want to tear up my NRA card. Yeah. I want to help Brady because I didn't serve my country in order to have to carry a gun in Walmart, right? That's not the America I stand for or I want to live in. And Which so is not I, an exaggeration, by the way. That happened, there was a shooting in Walmart last night. I know. Yeah. And it's, I say it because, ironically, he used it as an example before yeah. this tragic, tragic shooting yeah. in, in Walmart. But... He uses it as an example because we all in America kind of now live in fear of these events. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately what we want to do is really foster a dialogue through our campaign that's really aimed at trying to alter the perception about the real dangers of carrying or owning a gun. You know, about a decade ago, 47% of Americans thought that owning or carrying a gun made them safer. Today that is 63%. So it's risen significantly. The problem is that actually a gun in the home makes you at significantly increased risk that that gun is going to be used against you or very tragically, it's going to be used to harm someone you love. And the worst part of my job is having to interact with parents and others who were in a position of trust who had a gun lying around in the house and meant it for self-protection. Right. But that gun was found by a child in the home. You know, 73% of kids know exactly where the gun is in the home. We have all of the research to show. Most parents don't believe they know it, but they do know it. And eight kids a day die in this country because of that problem. So what we really want to do is engage in a conversation with gun owners about the dangers of having a gun in the home and make sure that if they're making the decision to have the gun, that they store it safely. And that can prevent a lot of really needless and very tragic deaths. I, I'm curious about, you talk about all these instances. It's important, I think, to make a distinction when talking about gun violence. It's not just mass shootings. Right. No. And I think uh, mass shootings tend to bring the conversation into the limelight. That's right. You know, and they and they bring it back to the forefront of everybody talking about it. But uh, you know, in the month since Vegas, I think I was it was in the same Samantha B report. You're saying close to 900 people uh, in America have been uh, uh, shot and, and killed by a gun just since in the one month. But we don't hear about that because there are no. little one-offs here. Somebody was just shot in Cooper Square yesterday morning. Like yep. it, it happens all the time. My question to you, I, I have two questions. One is. Does a, a tragic event like that uh, inform the decisions you guys are making and the roadmaps you're making? Is there a greater instilled sense of urgency like there is nationwide? Or do you always act with that sense of urgency because you guys are already fully aware of this problem? I think we as Americans are aware of the problem. We become comfortable with it. Something terrible happens and we're all talking about it again. What, what goes on on your side when, when something terrible like this happens to, uh, 
Well, obviously, it's a catalyst for action. Yeah. Uh, we are an organization that's very well versed in, you know, what the American psyche seems to be around these things, which is shock, and then uh, more quick internalization of this, moving on to the next thing. Um, I think the question is, when will all of us truly have enough? Yeah. At Brady, what we know is, for mass shootings, that's 1% to 2% of all gun deaths in America. Yeah, it's such a small figure. It's a very small figure. 93 people a day die from gun violence. So it is a, a tragedy that is occurring across the landscape in cities all across America every single day. We are very focused on that. Um, equally, I think with a situation like Vegas, what is also shocking and we're very focused on is the ease with which individuals intent on doing mass harm mm -hmm. can transform a semi-automatic weapon into what is effectively a machine gun. Yeah. So we're focused on all of the issues, but we can't forget the basic fact that 93 people a day are dying yeah. from gun violence. Do you find uh, zeroing in on those specific things, like uh, uh, limiting the type of gun that can be modified or, or shot in this particular way, or even like Samantha B was talking about a loophole uh, called the, the boyfriend loophole yeah. uh, as well. Do you find uh, finding these specific things to attack is a more successful approach uh, then uh, are you having more success with that than the passing gun control laws that, that take, uh, you know, the, the, I'm sorry, the background checks and make them universal and stuff like that? You know, when you get micro instead of macro, do you have greater success? Well, for us, um, you know, it's been a bit disheartening that everyone um, who looked at what the shooter used to transform the semi-automatic weapon into the machine gun in the Vegas situation, that's bump stocks, yeah. right? and high capacity magazines, most hunters didn't even know what bump stocks were. I mean, I talked to many gun owners, they had no idea. When the days following the incident, uh, the tragedy, legislation was introduced to ban them, and now everyone is backing away from that. So even that hasn't gone forward. From my perspective and from our organization's perspective, we need to have a comprehensive approach here, and that's what we lack. In the 50s and 60s, we had a, a drastic increase in the number of automobiles on the road. And there were fatalities that went along with that. And Congress didn't just look and say, well, people are dying, let's figure out the one thing that's going to solve the problem. They said, we need airbags, we need seat belts, there's something called speed limits, we should actually redesign our roads. People are alive today because that multi-layered system was put in. That's also what we're looking to do. Yeah. But none of it actually infringes on anyone's right to own a gun any more than putting a seatbelt on stopped people from manufacturing cars. Yeah. That's what we want. We're not naive about how to get there. It's going to have to be piecemeal. But one particular bill being passed is not going to solve this. Right. This is uh, an inherently uh, heavy and difficult conversation to have, but a very important one. Uh, but I do want to ask, how, how do you maintain optimism? How do you remain optimistic and, and keep pushing forward uh, in seemingly impossible circumstances the way every single day there's, there's more stories? And not only the stories we see in the news, but you guys, you can see the lines of code in the matrix. You see behind the curtain, you know all the numbers, and you know exactly how big of a problem this is. So uh, give me a trick or something I can do, <laughs> please. Uh, how do you guys do it? How do you keep going? Um, well, a couple of reasons. One, everyone likes David versus Goliath. Um, ultimately, I know that uh, we have truth and justice on our side and, and the uh, uh, view of the American people behind us. Beyond that, I'm affiliated with an organization that bears the name of Jim Brady. He never gave up. There was over seven years and six votes that it took to finally enact the Brady Law. So I don't think you can ever give up. I do think that in the years to come, there will be a shift around this. We've gone out actually over the last couple of months and we've talked in focus groups to gun owners about our social norm change campaign. And what's come back, this was post Vegas, which is really, really interesting is they all said, what is going on with this issue? Yeah. We want an organization that focuses on the middle ground. We're tired of living in this world where everyone is yelling at each other. Right. So I think we have the real opportunity to bring people along 
We just have to do a better job of educating, I think, the public about what they can do to make a difference. And actually, voting makes a big difference. Yeah. That does make a big difference. It makes a huge difference. And, and, and you genuinely believe, even with the current administration, that we can see progress? In the, in it's up to Congress, right. yes. So I do think that even with the current administration, we can see progress. Um, you know, President Trump, before he was President Trump, actually was fully supportive of expanding background checks. Yeah. He even said so, endorsing President Obama's statements after Sandy Hook. Well, he said anything, a lot of things. He has <laughs> said a lot of things. <laughs> anything is possible. Yeah. Yeah. If we can shift the demographics in Congress and get more individuals elected who are pro-gun violence prevention, we will get a bill passed, and I think it will be very hard mm -hmm. for that bill to be vetoed. Uh, we're going to turn it over uh, to audience Q&A in a second, but before we do, uh, I want to put a cap uh, with like two or three actionable, easy things that we can say to anybody that, that's affected by this or moved by, by the, the recent violence in America and all that, what they can do to contribute. Maybe it's go to this website to find more information. Maybe it's uh, inform yourself so you can vote. But let's, let's two or three things that we can give everybody to take away. This is how you can enact some change. I think number one, please do go to the Brady website, get yourself informed, talk to your friends and neighbors about the issue, make sure they understand that they can actually also make a difference, and actually contact your member of Congress. We all talk about the need to do that, and very few of us ever do. I can tell you that on the other side of the issue, as you have already mentioned, the people who are really, really pro NRA, they are contacting their members, and they remember that. So those are really important steps I would like everyone to take to actually really make a difference on the issue. And I would say, do not underestimate the power of Google. If you don't know how to contact your congressman, you can find it within less than 10 seconds. You can figure it out. If you don't know where the information is, you can go to the website. There's ways to do it. We can do it. We should all do it. Uh, let's yeah. go ahead and turn it over to audience Q&A. Let's take some questions. First one's going to be right over here, I believe. Hey, how you doing? Good. Um, as you said yourself, the, one of the biggest issues with this is that there are certain groups like the NRA who put so much money into politics to fight against proper legislation. And I'm from a mind to go even further than common just background checks and things like that. But do you think that the Brady campaign needs to expand its actual pursuits by attacking money in politics? Because if we could remove their financial power, wouldn't that weaken the fact that so many legislators are against proper legislation? I think it, it will help, and certainly Brady is relaunching its political action campaign to actually really get out there and support candidates who are with us and help them get elected. One of the things when I talk to members of Congress about the issue that I'm asked is, you know, the NRA money is substantial, but given the money in politics today, it's more the perception of their power and their membership base that gives them any sense of control. So what has to happen, I think, is more people who care about this issue have to make this particular issue, gun violence prevention, a priority. When you have a situation where, really, it's a small group of people in the end on the other side who are active on this issue, but the perception is it's a huge number. On our side, 94% of Americans agree with us, but they're not vocal enough. We actually have to make this an issue that's not a third rail issue. It has to be in the top one or two things that people care about, and if they're vocal about it, and they actually make it an issue in which they vote, because the other side does. It has to be a priority for us to vote on this issue, the candidates for us or against us. If we do that, we can make actually a huge difference on the issue. It's just not happening with a, enough routine across districts, in districts across the country. Thank you, uh, excellent question. Thank you for that. Next question is right here to our left. There's a big list of representatives who have taken money from the NRA. Um, has your organization personally met with the candidates who have not and perhaps collaborated on the future courses of actions for the next election? Yes, we routinely meet with candidates who are very strong supporters of Brady and really the gun violence prevention movement, and we appreciate everything they're doing. Unfortunately, there aren't enough of them, so we are putting together for 2018 the key strategies that we want them to endorse. Brady is putting together a scorecard 
where we will actually assess candidates based on their support of these measures, even if there's not a vote on them, on the bills. Have they co-sponsored the right bills? And then candidates who are running, we will also assess them as to whether or not they agree that they will endorse these proposals. We hope voters will educate themselves about those candidates and actually use these as tools when they're making a decision about who they're going to vote for. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Uh, I believe I'm getting the signal. We have time for one more, and it's going to be right here. Hi. Hello. Um, so uh, I know some uh, areas of the country uh, love their guns, um, including like one my one my friend in Houston. You know, like uh, when he moved there, he didn't care about it at all. But I, I was wondering, like, uh, is that something that you find where certain areas they there's a resist, even though there's laws to prevent it, but there's still a resistance of uh, or a fear of uh, them having their guns, like either not taken away, but just like more restrictions on like what they can do, or you know if they can go out for a sport or. Um, yeah, yeah, there is certainly a rich tradition of hunting in certain areas of our country. We don't find that in big cities <laughs> like Manhattan, um, but I have lived in places where you certainly find people going hunting every weekend. And so there is this rich tradition of guns and guns in the home. For a lot of folks who are in that category, though, they actually really do support reasonable restrictions. They don't want just anyone having access to a gun. What I would say the NRA has done with a certain segment of the population is convince them that any restriction is really a back door aimed at taking their guns. Yeah. And that's why, although President Obama did nothing to make anyone insecure about a gun in their home or his, his desire to take one away, the NRA stoked this fear that that's what his hidden agenda was. And gun sales dro rose dramatically throughout President uh, Obama's presidency with this fear that somehow guns were going to be taken away. Since President Trump was elected, gun sales have gone down because a segment of the population believes that they're safe. It's all based on a myth, a lie, that the NRA has propagated that anyone who wants to talk about reasonable protections related to guns, their hidden agenda is to take guns away. And it's just simply not true. Um, and that's part of what we want to do is really educate people about that and make sure that folks who are members of the NRA simply because they signed up because they wanted to go to the local shooting range <laughs> understand that our organization actually is in completely in line with their views and that a background check that stops a criminal or a fugitive from getting a gun is in everyone's interest. And I think we're getting there. Uh, thank you guys for your questions. Uh, and I will say, yeah, sure, round, round of applause, yeah, absolutely. Seems appropriate. It's an appropriate thing to do. Uh, before I wrap things up, I do want to hammer home one more time the, the website uh, and the URL, if you don't mind sharing, so people can go uh, where they can find all the information. Yes, www.bradycampaign.org. Perfect. And what yeah. we're going to do, we're going to put a little Chiron. We'll put that on the screen. People Thank can go you. to it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I would say this whole thing can be so overwhelming, uh, and there's so many different facets. And then you get into the, the conspiracy of the NRA and the, what they want you to believe. And it, it's very easy to just you know, be taken aback and not know where to begin. Uh, I appreciate all the work you guys are doing. I appreciate your site for helping explain it. Uh, and, and for those out there that may have been equally overwhelmed by, uh, by the information, again, do not underestimate the power of Google. Uh, there are great resources out there just like That's this great. one. Uh, we all got to do our part. One more time, please join me in thanking Chris Brown for being here and talking to us. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you.